Oi, oi, and welcome to the Orient Outlook podcast, sponsored by Carol Angley Flores, with myself, Steve Nussbaum, and as always, I'm joined by my good friend, my South Dan chum, the beard legend, the one and only, the daddy-o, it's Senor Paul Levy. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. This is episode number 348, and as always, thanks to everyone who tuned into last week's show. This week, we've got a roundup of news from the last week. Our review of our fantastic win yesterday against Oxford United. Promotion chasing Oxford United, no less. And we're also delighted to have CEO Mark Devlin waiting on the phone to speak to us. So without further ado, let's just crack on. And as always, we start with a word from our sponsor. We certainly do. So our sponsors are Carol Langley Florist. They're based in Chinkford and have served the borough of Waltham Forest and the surrounding area for over the last 70 years. A fantastic team of florists are here for all your needs, specialising in anything from bespoke wedding events, family funeral tributes, birthdays, anniversaries, and it feels like we've only just got past Valentine's Day, but in two weeks it is Mother's Day, so get your orders in. That shop is going to be rammer, and it gets better. As always, they offer 15% off to all O's fans and staff, which could give you a huge saving on any of your costs. So to get in touch with the shop, you can give them a call on the phone on 0208 Five two nine four one three zero, or you can go and look at their website. You can find the website www.carolangley.co.uk, or you can go on social media. You can find the guys on there. You can find them on Instagram under Carol Langley Florist. You can find the guys on Twitter at Carol Langley E four, or you can find the team on Facebook under Carol Langley Florist. Indeed. So as I mentioned just a moment ago, we are absolutely thrilled and delighted to have a guest with us this week, no less. And CEO Mark Devlin. Mark, thanks very much indeed again for coming on and joining us. And we're starting with a slightly sombre point, unfortunately, uh, this week, in that um, unfortunately we lost a former player, uh, Stan Bowles. Um, I understand he was one of your favourite players. Yes, uh, Aiden Gents. Yeah, um, it was a bit. Uh, it was a bit poignant, really. Uh, it had been a, a great day yesterday, and and then shortly after I got home, I heard uh, that um, Stan had had really sadly passed away. So he was he was pivotal in in my love of football as a kid when I used to go to Loftus Road, uh, and he played in a in a tremendous QPR team in the mid seventies, uh, and obviously he graced um, other clubs as well. I mean, and I think I've. Recently, I had a, a conversation on Twitter with a couple of people that um, I think I came across to uh, sunny Brisbane Road in the early 80s to, to watch Rangers play. And Stan was playing for Orient and Orient um, really thumped Rangers 4-0 and Stan played a full part in it. So, um, yeah, he's my footballing hero, footballing idol, my I'm one of those sad ones as well. My son is called Stan um, in honour of Mr Bowles oh, wow. and so he had a real big effect on me. So it's, uh, it's you know, tremendously sad news. Uh, my condolences go to Stan's family and friends and everyone connected um, with the Bowles family. But mm. uh, yeah, really sad news. And I know that Orient fans, you may have played a lot less games for him, but I... Um, been reading some of the comments on social media and he clearly had a, uh, a place in, in, in lots of O's fans' hearts as well uh, as he did at some of the other clubs he played for. So um, a sad loss. He's been ill for a few years now. Um, but yeah, re really sad news. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure all those fans will agree on that. So Mark, thinking of a better time yesterday, we went away to Oxford United that Paul mentioned in his intro and had a fantastic 2-1 win. I mean, what were your thoughts on that game yesterday? Uh, well, it, it's it's not just the the win, which I think surprised um, uh, surprised the bookies looking at the odds in the morning. Um, but uh, but it was the nature of the performance. I mean, uh, Oxford, I thought, were really good when they came to our place and took a three nil lead before we got back into the game. Uh, and when they went one up, I was a little concerned. But I have to say, we'd been relatively in control of the game up until that point, until they scored, and then bossed most of the the rest of the first half and. Uh, even the Oxford guys at half time were saying how fortunate they were to be one up. Um, and the guys just picked it up in the second half. Tremendous performance. A couple of great goals. Monk's goal was, was, was really well taken and he clearly enjoyed himself there. Um, and, and look, if we're going to, if we're going to nibble away and keep chipping away at, uh, the playoff places, certainly. And six, then uh, we, we needed to go to Oxford and win and we probably need to go to Stevenage and win in a few weeks' time. And to be honest with you, we probably need to you know try and pick up as many wins as possible, but they're clearly against teams that we're, we're chasing. 
uh, and that's the same goes for for Tuesday night when we've got a chance to uh, to climb. Um, I think we can climb above Blackpool as well if we beat them tomorrow. So fantastic performance yesterday. Uh, a word to the crowd as well. We were sat directly opposite the fantastic, you know, nearly 1,200 fans there making great noise. So it was a really, really good afternoon. And you only have to read the plaudits coming out of Oxford, you know, from the fans and social media. Their own fans had to admit that they they had been outclassed yesterday, out outthought and outfought with a couple of great goals, great support. Um, it was a really good afternoon. And, and hopefully we can take that into Tuesday night now. Hopefully so. Hopefully so. And I, I agree with your analysis there. I think there was a, only one team in it in the first half. Um, and they were super lucky to be ahead. They had one effort at goal and, and ended up scoring it. In terms of the season, though, Mark, we currently sit ninth in the in, in the league table. Um, obviously, given the injuries and suspensions that we've had, what are your sort of thoughts on, on how well we're doing or, or where we're at at the moment in terms of uh, position or, or just even as a club in general? Um, well, I, I mean, it's it's been it's been well trodden now that um, uh, that uh, Nigel and the board set a target of 14th and above, and that was kind of based on being new in the division, the kind of uh, budget that we had from a playing point of view, um, and we th- thought that that was fair. You know, expecting. Uh, being able to afford the kind of budget we had and expecting Richie and the guys to be up in the playoffs was probably a little bit past what we thought was really achievable when you look at some of the clubs in our division, size of the clubs and the size of the playing budgets that we believe they're, you know, they're playing with. So, and again, you know, talking about yesterday, when you think how short we are in terms of injuries, add Jordan's suspension to that as well, um, it's just fantastic. It just made it even more of a fantastic result than it was. So, from a playing point of view, I don't think anyone can really argue that we're um, we're not doing extremely well. We we we're probably a little bit further ahead than we anticipated. Uh, and to, and to be really to, to be clear, you know, no one is frightened of, of going for the playoffs and and being successful in the playoffs and going up a division. It would be a huge challenge um, for the club to get into the championship. But uh, behind the scenes, we've recruited people of of a, of a high calibre to help us grow our revenues, to help us uh, help me and, and the rest of the team run the club off the field as proficiently and as professionally as possible and to meet the needs of a, of a, of a growing club. So on, on the field, the guys are doing fantastically well, credit to everyone involved there. And off the field, you know, I'm really lucky. I've said this before, but you know, the staff that have been around for a number of years have continued to work incredibly hard and well and, and very ably on behalf of the club. And the guys that have joined us, um, both men and women who've joined us over the past year or so, uh, have come in and played a full part. I, I believe in really helping to take the club forward. We're in. Uh, I would. I certainly, from a personal point of view, would not be frightened at all if we um, if we got into the championship. The frightening thing would be that we would have to try and compete, and we would need to keep it generating additional revenues and so forth and so forth. But that's what players are in it to play at the highest level possible, and and people like myself want to want to play as want to want to work at, up as as high as possible as well. And we've got some really good staff at the club who understand the club, understand the football business, are smart in the areas that they're responsible for. Uh, and I'm really positive about where we are currently now and, and where the next few years we'll see the club going. Very exciting times to be um, an Orient fan. I'm not going to ask you too many questions about championship football because I, I don't want to kind of ruin the uh, <laughs> the vibe at the moment. But before we come on to listen to questions, and we've got loads for you, Mark, we always, when we announce uh, a member of the board or yourself on the podcast, we always get an influx of questions about stadium and training ground. So is there anything you can share in terms of stadium development at the moment or any, any news on the training ground? Okay, so take the training ground first. We're at we're at the pre-app phase of planning uh, on. Um, so we put a pre-app into uh, Epping Forest Council with, um, for the site at Chigwell, where we're currently at, for extending the facilities there. So the project team have been working on that now for a number of months. We've had various reports you have to go through, whether it's ecology, reports on trees, reports on uh, you know traffic surveys, everything that goes into it, as well as using specialists that know the people at Epping Forest Council well. Uh, all of that has gone in uh, into the mix, along with the architects who've, who've put up the 
up some uh, some drawings, some pre preliminary drawings for both the school to look at and have made comments on. And that includes the people at Old Chigwellians because Old Chigwellians will still be in and around the area as well because they, they have a, a contract with the school. So that is moving nicely along. Um, we we it hopefully will then get some feedback from the council within the next three or four weeks. That will then help us go away, look at the planning um, uh, document and make whatever changes it is we, we are able to make and need to make um, if we decide to go ahead with it. And then we would go to a full planning process. So uh, we're, we've started the ball rolling and we're doing we're, we're as far along as we can be at this moment in time with the training ground. I'm very hopeful that within certainly within the next year that we would um, we would put a spade in the ground and start building on that site there as long as nothing comes out of the uh, the planning application that we don't foresee we don't expect it to be plain sailing it never is particularly in and around London uh, but we think we're in a good place with that so that's the training ground Quick the question. stadium is at a very a very early stage we when Nigel was over last week for uh, both the Barnsley and Northampton games, uh, I had already met with the new CEO of Waltham Forest. Nigel then and I met with um, her and uh, her senior planning colleague and the leader of, and both of them and the leader of the council came to the Northampton game, so they were royally entertained. It was a great game for them to come to. But the council have made it crystal clear to us that they are very, very, very keen for us to stay in the borough. In fact, they're really keen for us to stay in Leighton, which is fine by us. That Nigel has made a point of saying that, you know, we want to stay as close to our our current routes and our historic routes as possible. We're not looking to, to move miles away. That's that's clear. Um, the council, though, want us to make sure that we explored and we have explored every possible opportunity on the current site. We've already commissioned a report which shows that it's going to be difficult for us to build the size of stadium that we feel we will need in order to generate the revenues that will allow us to be competitive and to be sustainable in the next few years. Um, so we need to work with the council to go through every... every opportunity there may be on the current site before we turn our full attention to other sites within the borough that um, indicated may be good sites for us to look at. One or two other sites have come through some other inquiries as well. So we've had really, really positive conversations with Wolf and Forest. Um, and, you know, it, but it, we're at a very early stage. This, I mean, I know it's well documented, but I can only really draw on my on my Brentford experience. And, and long before I joined Brentford, I think they'd been, I joined them in 2011, they'd already been looking for a new site for nine or ten years then, and they, and they didn't actually start building the stadium until 2018. So it can be a very long process. So I think we've, we've, we've said that if we do have to move stadium, um, it's probably a ten-year plan. And I would hope that we could achieve, you know, it, it might be achievable in maybe six or seven years if we are very lucky with finding a site and planning and everything else. If all our, our ducks fall into a row, uh, we could be lucky. But it, it, realistically, it's probably a seven, eight, nine, ten year um, plan, really. But uh, uh, we do have to work with the council. But I do want to stress that the council has been incredibly positive. Uh, in fact, m far more positive than maybe I expected. I mean, they really have, they really do want us to stay in the borough, but that doesn't mean that they can throw money at us. It doesn't mean that they can sidetrack rules and regulations, but I do think that we'll be able to, to work with the borough to come up with a really good solution and one that suits supporters and the club if, in fact, we do have to move away from the current site. And my gut feeling is we probably do need to move away because... It, it's really unlikely that we can get anywhere near a sort of a 16, 17,000 stadium with increased facilities to help us generate more revenue on on the current site. But we have to explore every every possibility first before we go full steam ahead looking at other sites. Thanks, Mark. Sorry, I just wanted to ask a follow-up question with regards to the training ground, and, and it's great to hear that the progress that's being made. Does that mean that we have purchased or are purchasing the Chigwell training ground, um, or does that mean that we've got a significantly uh, you know, long lease on the ground if we're investing such money to, to do a full rebuild? 
Well, so we won't be buying the site because the land belongs to Chigwell School. Chigwell, Chigwell School is on 100 acres, um, so they're not short of land. No. But we do have a really good relationship with them. So we will be negotiating a long-term lease because, again, I think it's been documented, but the training ground is likely to cost uh, in the region of £4 million, um, pounds, uh, maybe a little bit more. It uh, depends on things that fall out of the planning application. Um, so we will be negotiating a long lease with the school. But the school, again, uh, welcoming, um, uh, are, are really welcoming of the fact that we're looking at this. We've worked with them. We've met with them on a number of occasions now, taken on board their comments and those of old Chigwellians. Um, so, yeah, it, this wouldn't be a purchase of land. This would be a long-term lease. Great stuff. Thank you uh, for your answers there, Mark. So, like we said... Sorry, just one other. How is this being paid for? And we'd be castigated if we didn't ask. And Nigel's spoken about future investment. Is, is that something that someone's put their hand up and said, I can cover that or pay for it? Yeah, I, I mean, future investors, uh, any future investors will probably play a part in it. But the current board will cover the cost of that. We're also exploring other other options. Um, fans may well have seen what uh, Norwich City have done. Uh, Queen's Park Rangers, Bolton, they worked with uh, some bond um, capital raising companies that, uh, well, they raised funds through through bonds with supporters. So there'll be, and, and we've actually had some comments from fans um, asking if those opportunities will, will present themselves. So we will look at those opportunities. We will look at uh, whether they are viable options or not. But the um, the current board and any future investors that we the money will definitely be there whether it comes from the current board or whether it's a current board plus any new investors that come on board during the process that we're currently going through. So um, that has been taken care of, uh, and once we get through the planning process, we will then come up with the, the cash flow process and over the build time, which will show how the four million odd pounds will have to be paid out over the period of time that would be the next thing that happens so once we um once we get the uh, positive nod if you like from from the planners so that part of it has been covered clearly uh, we wouldn't be entering into any kind of uh, work of this nature if there wasn't the uh, ability to pay for the um, pay for the investment thank you Sounds great. Great question, Mr. Levy. So like we said, we had loads of listener questions, so we're just going to fire away at you, Mark. So the first one's from Chris W underscore one, who says, where does Mark see the Orient in the next five years? <laughs> I would realistically probably still playing at the stadium, our current site, hopefully in the championship and hopefully a lot closer to um, a near break-even figure than, than we currently are. We've, we've made giant strides to reduce the losses this year. We'll probably take about a million pounds plus out of the loss this year. Um, so I, I think there's, you know, our plan was to try and get promoted. We'd like to try and get promoted by 2027 at the very latest. That's kind of the plan. So in five years' time, I would hope that we would be seeing a regularly filled Gorn Group Stadium um, playing championship football uh, with a club that's got uh, its finances well and truly in order and is as and is sustainable as, as any football club can be. In terms of the South Stand, uh, David Carroll one said, um, are the South Stand facilities going to be upgraded and will South Stand season ticket card season card holders sorry be consulted? Um, yeah, that, that's that's the main question I think that he's asking there about the South Stand bar being renovated, updated. I know there's a lot of East Stand listeners that will be moaning about how good we've got it in the South Stand and how they haven't, but we'll come on to the East Stand in a minute. Yeah, we're very aware that the South Stand bar is very tired uh, <laughs> and, and some of the other facilities there. I've seen a couple of questions about toilets not all of the toilets being available and things like that. So we do recognise that we need to update the South Stand Bar, along with everything that we're trying to do that raises more revenue and helps us provide better facilities for our supporters, which inevitably leads to increased revenues. Um, one, of the, one of the ways we're going to do that is that our pouring rights contract um, with Green King ends at the end of this year. It looks very unlikely that Green King will be with us past the end of this season. And we have had uh, two or three really um, good offers already uh, come into the commercial team. 
and uh, part of the uh, part of our negotiations has been that anyone who comes in and takes over the contract will assist us in some way, shape, or form in all of our stands, but particularly in the South Stand Bar, which we do recognise needs to be updated and improved. One of our plans is to try and see how we might be able to use it not just make it better for match days, but how we might be able to use it on non-match days. But firstly, we want to get, we want to make it much better, a uh, much better experience for the fans who use the South Stand, and also then, um, if it then means that we can do stuff away from match days and, and 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 generate more revenue, then that will be great. But first and foremost, improve the bar. We'll take another look at all the toilets and and make sure that we can reopen all of the toilet facilities there because. The stadium is so compact and so short of space that, you know, one of the toilets, let's be uh, being absolutely frank, it is locked because um, we, we're, we're using it for storage, which is, uh, I, I totally accept is wrong, but we just don't have anywhere else to put the gear that's currently in there. So we're trying desperately to find space somewhere for um, the, what's being currently held in one of the loos in the South Stand so that we can open it up because, you know, in this day and age, we need to, we fully understand we've got to make the facilities as good as they could possibly be in a in an older existing stadium. So South Stand is definitely on our radar. I would hope that during the close season, along with what we plan in the East Stand, which we'll talk about no doubt later, um, <laughs> that we will see a, a revamp of the South Stand and part of that will be with our new Pouring Rights Partners um, assistance. Brilliant stuff. Sounds great. We had two questions in from Orient Steve 72 The first one says, could we not arrange, well, could we have a fan zone in the Coronation Gardens or in the Piazza area of the new development? So asking about a, fa- a possible fan zone somewhere and it also goes on to ask about the PA system, whether that will be upgraded in the summer. Uh, okay, so from a fan zone point of view, Coronation Gardens, we, we've... There are, there, there are certain ideas we've got for Coronation Gardens. We think more likely... Um, more likely is that we will we will operate uh, a fan zone in Brisbane Road. We'll close Brisbane Road down on match days, and try and make that into a a, a fan zone area. Obviously, that side of the ground houses visiting supporters, so we need to take that into account. Uh, again, we've got we've got virtually no footprint. Um, around the stadium, Coronation Gardens is is probably the most obvious one. And at some point, over in the new development of, of flats across the road on Oliver Road, there will be some kind of um, uh, square, Coronation Square, I think it's going to be called, where the council are already asking us if we want to get involved in in trying to make that something of a um, a fan zone on match days. Those conversations are still ongoing as as the building work takes place. So we've looked at Coronation Gardens. I think we've tried it on a couple of occasions. To be fair, I think we've probably only marketed it half asked. to be honest with you. Um, so there's there's a few things that we'd want to talk to our, our community trust about doing uh, some uh, pre-match entertainment in Coronation Gardens. But I do think it's more likely that if we can come up with a traffic management order and, and, and have the council fully support us in that, we will have to pay for it, but the council have to support us. And they've indicated they would. There's a couple of things we need to sort out with the council. We, we are kind of looking to see how we can close Brisbane Road down, make it safer pre-match and create some kind of fan zone there. Also allowing for the fact that we'll need to keep our safety advisory group and the police happy that um, it won't cause us any issues with visiting fans as well. So uh, we are looking at various options. Not, there are no easy solutions to that, that particular problem, but we would like to create a fan zone of, of sorts around the ground. So we will continue to look at that. And about the PA system, any any plans to upgrade the PA system? Oh, sorry, system? the PA system. Um, the PA system, given that we are likely to be spending in excess of half a million pounds over in the East Stand and in other areas of the stadium, just making some small improvements, I have to say it's unlikely that we will spend, we will have the capital uh, to put into uh, improving the PA system next season, um, so we may we will make some tweaks to it, but we're not going to at this moment in time. The plan is not to overspend on the PA system. We see other areas as being um, you know a uh, higher priority at this moment in time. There's, there's only so much money to go around as well. Thanks, Mark. Boatsy asked a couple of questions about the friendly with the at Jam Tarts, the Hearts friendly that we've got coming up. <clears throat> excuse me, in July. First question is, 
Will we be playing any other Scottish teams as part of the pre-season visit or are we just going up there for that one match? Do you know? At, at the moment, all that is planned is the Hearts game. But it does make... Uh, we, I have spoken to uh, Lingy and Richie. Uh, it does make sense to... Um, it, whilst we're up there, to potentially play more games while we're in Scotland. It doesn't quite provide the, it, the sporting facilities and indeed the warmth of uh, going abroad to a Spain or a Portugal. Um, but it is something that we're looking at. So at the moment, I have to say, it's only the Hearts game and the team may well then fly from there to wherever we uh, we go on the summer camp, if you like, training camp. Uh, but it could happen that we stay up in Scotland and uh, and play, you know, some more games and have a training camp up in Scotland. That still has to be decided. But for the moment, it, it is uh, the plan is just the one game against Hearts. But that might change as uh, as the next you know few weeks progress and we uh, start really looking at the pre-season training camp. Cool. The second question is: Will there be a special? Uh, so, when will the special one-off kit be available to purchase, and will there be kid sizes available? So it will be available to purchase sometime next month. Um, so the plan is to it, it, it would be a limited edition to about a thousand shirts, just under a thousand shirts. Uh, there will be kid sizes, and it will be available for pre-order. I don't have an exact date in March, but probably mid-March, I would think, is when it will go, be available for pre-order. Great stuff. Looking forward to seeing it. We had a question from mystery underscore Bumika, who says, can we have the full food and drinks menu on the Swipe Station app available in the West End? Uh, so we are continuing to look at our digital menus and how we could improve those next year. The short answer to that is we're looking to put the full menu on there as much... Any menu we put on there, we need to be able to deliver. There's no point putting um, foodstuffs on a digital menu that we then can't deliver or run out of stock of or whatever it might be. We can't quite operate in the same way as a, as a McDonald's or a Burger King does because of the facilities. But we are looking to put as much of the uh, F&B, food and beverage, um, whatever's available, we're looking to put that onto the digital boards for next season. So we're, we are looking to run a trial with another organisation as well towards the end of the season, which might, might A, make the order process simpler, because if I'm being honest with you, it's been, it's been a marginal success, the swipe station, but it still hasn't quite... Um, achieved what we were hoping it would achieve. We think that there are too many too many clicks. The, the customer journey, to use the jargon, is not as smooth as it needs to be. So we've been looking at um, and talking to Swipe Station and other organisations. So the short answer to that question is we're looking to put as much as possible on our digital menus next year and um, uh, hopefully we will get as much as possible down because we know that that's what people want. We know that more and more fans are getting used to you know ordering via digital services. So we're trying to see the best way of doing it. As I say, we're running a trial with another organisation to see if we can make the whole transaction and process much much more simple and much smoother and quicker. Essex Biz asked a bit of a commercial uh, focus question. Said, how are things going with regards to hiring out the function suites? How much more are they being hired out compared to last year? So we're well ahead of, uh, so our non-match day revenues are well ahead of last year. Uh, we've seen a significant increase where, where we have, um, we've advertised in other areas. We've spread our marketing spend a bit further and a bit more targeted. And we have got, no, we've got the return, we've got customers returning all the time, but actually we're trying to get new business in there as well. And so we have seen a significant number of new companies coming in on, uh, on uh, non-match days. I still want to see it busier, but it's it's moving nicely in the right direction. Um, and the same goes for, for match day hospitality as well, which was a slow burner at first, but has really picked up from sort of November, December onwards and, it, and is really doing well now. Great stuff. We have our first East End question. So R. Houghton19 asks, will there be any effects on the East End for season ticket holders or will all works to the Undercroft be completed in the close season? Now, the plan is for all the work to be completed in the close season. So we've been through a tender process with uh, building companies. We've uh, found the preferred uh, company that we're going to use. Um, we have a nice problem in that, uh, obviously, when we first started talking to them, we they were planning to come in the first day 
as soon as literally the day after our final home game of the season, or given how well the team are doing, that might be extended by a little while. Okay. Um, but they, uh, but they, uh, whatever happens, whenever they come in, the plan is for those works to be completed. So there'll be no, the the, the plan is that there'll be no reduction in any of the uh, seating areas. In fact, the work we plan to undertake will, f we hope, because we've obviously had the council involved in some of the uh, issues in the East Stand, plus some of the improvements we plan, uh, will actually bring us back to a full capacity, which could give us another between four and 500 seats in the East Stand for us to sell on a regular basis to our own supporters. So, um, no, we don't, it'll be completed during the summer, that's the plan, and no effect to um, e people who use the East Stand season card holders or, or people who purchase on match days. Veggie Jones asks about the, the electric advertising board, says, is it possible to use those advertising boards to spark crowd noise like the NFL games at Wembley and Spurs? Like, for example, you press a button to instigate a make some noise message at corners or to show the first line of a chant. I've not really considered it before. It's, it's like a, yeah. No, I, I think there are other ways we can uh, utilise the, the boards. Um, with, you know, not only that kind of message, which is which is obviously very American, but given our ownership, it's not something we should ignore. Uh, but also um, putting out social messages and so forth. It will probably requires a bit of a tweak to the software, as I understand it, that we utilise um, on our particular digital boards. But there's no, we, we will certainly look at that because the whole idea of them is not only to generate revenue, but also, I don't think, I don't think English. Uh, football crowds feel they need to be encouraged to uh, sing or chant or the first line. However, um, I think they can still be very engaging. Uh, and coming back to your earlier question about surveying fans in stands, we will probably be asking you know questions along those lines because it's a fine line to be walked between offending fans, you know, calling them customers and things like that, and uh, and doing things that we think will will add. You know, some some clubs. Uh, fans don't like drums. Well, I, I personally think that ever since the guys in the South Stand have brought the drums in, um, it's really helped the atmosphere and really helped the players. Um, so you know, we will look at it, but it will require a bit of a tweak, and we will sort of take a bit of a a bit of a straw poll from fans as well, because we don't, as I say, it's a fine line between offending fans uh, and us thinking that we're over Americanizing things. But we do want to make the most of those digi boards, and that is a fair idea. Great stuff. Rainbow Sailor is back. So he asked a question to Nigel and Nigel said he was going to ask you. I don't know whether he did or not. I guess we're going to find out in a second. So Rainbow Sailor says, as Nigel couldn't answer my green question and defer to Mark, are there plans for recycling bins by the food outlets? And what did we do for the green match day that I believe was a couple of weeks ago? So um, we have been working with our contractor Bywaters on recycling. So we've we've done a whole load of work through the offices. There should be far better recycling bins um, around food outlets. So that's something I'm going to take up with Bywaters because we do want to be greener. We do want to recycle. We are talking to a number of firms. and I think we're shortly going to be uh, awarding a contract to a company to put solar panels on some of the roofs. Uh, so cleaner in the way we generate electricity as well so i will take that one away there should be um many more recycling bins in and around the stadium not just around, but just general waste as well um where we're trying to be as green as possible because we know we have a responsibility like every business i think quite rightly has a responsibility to reduce its carbon footprint and and the amount of waste that we have um so I will look into that. So if they're not already in place, I will make sure that the guys talk to the stadium guys talk to Bywaters because we should really have those in place already. Lord Griff asks if you're going to be reproducing the 88-89 promotion winning sh uh, shirt in conjunction with uh, at Spall Retro to celebrate the 35th year anniversary. <sighs> We are going to continue to reproduce lots of our uh, retro shirts. They've gone down so well. They've been so well received and sold so well that uh, Lucy Freeman and the people responsible for our merchandise and our retailing will continue to bring out a range of retro shirts. And that will undoubtedly include the, um, the shirts from years where we've been successful in those seasons that are nearest and dearest to supporters um, 
hearts and minds and memories. So undoubtedly we will get to that one. Um, the checkerboard one has gone in fantastically well. There's not very many of them left at all. Mm. Who we produce it with, if I'm honest with you, I leave that to find the, the best supplier. So we will continue to produce a full range of retro shirts because they've just been so popular. Speaking of retro shirts, Mark, Retro Day is always good fun. I think there was one earlier in the season. Any plans to do another one um, at the remainder of this season at all? I'm, I'm sure there will be. Uh, the marketing team have a whole list of ideas for the games from here season uh, and so I'm sure Retro Day and Scarf Day and all those kinds of things will, will crop up as we um, as we play the remainder of our home matches uh, Stephen Orient uh, has another question around the East Stand, he says are there any plans to improve the signage in the East Stand for seats the current letters on the end of the rows are a couple of inches higher and not really visible due to coats etc, it's been raised before but no action has been taken uh, that's just one of the questions I did see on social media, <laughs> and uh, I, I, I must admit, I didn't know about this um, issue, so I will talk to the stadium team about that one, and we'll have a look at that and see what can be done to um, make things more legible. We, we obviously want our signage to be as, as easy and clear and instantly recognisable and uh, informative as possible, so we'll look at that, and we'll take that point on board. Rich G underscore LOFC asks, on the odd occasion one of my kids can't make a game, would it be possible to upgrade their season ticket to an adult via the website for a one-off game? Has, uh, has used the ticket resale, but not always easy to get that person to register and choose the correct seat. I will talk to take that up. I don't see why in this day and age it isn't possible to do that online. I mean, we, you know, we partner with Ticketmaster, one of the biggest ticketing organisations in the world. I will talk with, um, again, Lucy Freeman and the ticketing team to see how we can do that because that... Uh, it should be very easy for people to upgrade a kid's ticket to an adult's ticket and that should be available online. I don't know why that may not be available at this moment in time. I'm not sort of close enough to the system to, to give you a, uh, a more in-depth answer, but it's something I will talk to Lucy about um, over the next few days and, and come back with a fuller response to that. Gorillas1985 tweeted us a question that you may have seen. It got a lot of traction on social media. So Mark asks, is it viable that we make the East Stand just a home stand to increase the capacity with part of it becoming a kid's area and then moving the away fans to the North Stand? I have to say, it's not something we've considered. Um, uh, we, you know, uh, this time last year, it's a great, it's a, it, to, to coin a Nigel phrase, it's a high-class problem. We were being <laughs> asked by Orient fans uh, in the East Stand uh, whether we were going to be giving over the whole of the East Stand to visiting mm -hmm. fans. But um, such has been the level of support this year that we've never had to even remotely consider that, even when a good number of clubs have asked us for more tickets than we're able to provide them with. So there's no plans for us to do that at the moment. Again, that, that is something that um, I think the playing side like to have visiting fans to the side rather than behind a goal. I think there's a psychological thing about that and we want to be as supportive to Richie and the players as we can be. Um, that might be something that we will consider in any new stadium development but for the moment, there's no plans to, to move away fans to anywhere other than they are now and just to provide better facilities in the East End for both visiting and, and our own supporters. Dan underscore Coleman 98 um, said, is there any update on the Wigan tickets as the match is only now two weeks away? I think someone messaged saying that Wigan have mid-season changed their ticketing platforms. That probably is leading to some of the issues. But do you have an update at all? Yeah, I saw that. I saw that question as well. So I quickly sent a note across to Lucy, who very kind, whoever it is has informed you of that is absolutely right. The reason why um, we we're on sale with Stevenage, which is you know after the Wigan game, and we haven't got Wigan on sale, is because they've made a change to their ticketing supplier mid-season. It's all to do with them wanting us to have digital tickets. Um, Lucy believes the ticketing team believe that we should be able to go on sale with Wigan tickets uh, probably by Tuesday or Wednesday of this week at the latest it's obviously a fairly big from memory it's a fairly big visiting section there so I think we'll have plenty of tickets to go around um, but that's that's been the, the reason it's not been ourselves uh, it's just that Wigan for whatever their reasons are they've, they've changed ticketing supply so that's caused the delay we should be able to go on sale within the next 48 72 hours 
we had a, a message from a, a listener who uh, has asked to not be named about uh, the get some gallery issues. I think they must sit in the gallery. Uh, first question is why are gallery season ticket holders only allowed to get their free drinks before the game and not a soft drink at half time? And then went to follow up to say why have South Stand season ticket has been able to upgrade to the gallery for another fifty pound for half a season? And then went on to ask why are gallery tickets not available to buy online. So I appreciate there's quite a lot of questions within that. Right, gallery gallery tickets should be available to be bought online, so I will definitely pick that one up. I'm I'm pretty certain I've I've even bought gallery tickets for friends who, um, so I can't quite understand why gallery tickets aren't available online. Um, there is a rationale behind the whole drink policy. It's so that when people come in, they have their bit. We are still trying to generate revenue um, out of the uh, out of the gallery. So the whole idea is that people come in, they get, they have their beer before a game, they get their cold teas and coffees at half time, and then obviously they they drink after the game, or they have another beer or two at half time. It's just trying to. It's sometimes quite difficult whether we even, you know, we we look at the gallery product and we take the free beer out and we change the pricing, and you you buy your beer. You you don't. There's no free beers in, involved or free soft drink. Uh, we've just been tinkering with that over the past couple of seasons. So we, we will look at that one again. But it seems to work well for most people. We don't get an awful lot of complaints about the system. Um, and if people turn up late and they haven't had their free drink. There's always a degree of common sense between uh, Lucy Gammons and the and the hospitality team, so that we try not to uh, penalise anyone because obviously you know uh, traffic and things like that mean that sometimes people can't get there quite when they want to or they get there after the start of the game. So uh, I don't think we plan to change too much in the gallery at the moment. Um, we we've taken on board some of the comments about people being able to go in there. So gallery members were surveyed and we. They're able to invite up a couple of guests at the end of the game. Um, and there's a process now for that in place that seems to be working fairly well. I think it still has some teething issues, but um, it's working better clearly than it was at the start of the season. Uh, I'm not sure about the South, Grain, South Stand upgrade uh, question, though. That one's one that was... Good. Do you mind just running that past me again? Yeah, absolutely, Marcus. Is, um, why have South Stand season ticket holders been able to upgrade to the gallery for another £50 for half a season? I don't know is the answer on that one there. I'd need to talk to the team. I have to be really honest with you. I can't give you an answer on that one without speaking to the okay. ticketing team. Yeah, no as to, uh, uh, That's a new one on me, so I'd need to find out why, what that's about. So, sorry, I can't answer that one at this moment in time. No problem. Um, and Thor on the forum asks about, um, and this probably ties into the mm. conversations you're having with the new, the new pouring rights partners that you uh, mentioned earlier, uh, and whether or not the option to have a mobile beer unit, or in this case owned by the club and used on match days, which just serves beer and or soft drinks, for example. So have you considered a, perhaps a mobile uh, drinks uh, unit, which then would free up the, um, the kiosks for perhaps just food only or you know, speeds things up for those that just want to drink? Was that in any particular stand? No. Just so we, we do part of the upgrade in the east stand is that we we are looking to introduce e e bars these sort of uh, almost computerised um, but very very quick where you can get your beer very quickly they they operate at a number of stadia uh, and seem to be very successful and 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 popular so we're looking at introducing technology there where it makes it. Uh, better. Um, we are going to look completely, I mean, the good thing about bringing in a new pouring rights partner is that you get a fresh set of eyes. They, being frank, they want to they want to generate as much money. They want uh, us to buy as much beer from them as is possible. They want us to sell as much beer as possible and as much drink as possible. And the easier they can do it and the uh, better uh, we can be and, the, and how quick we can of this is obviously key to that given the fairly short windows that we have pre-match and at half time and a little bit after the game so we will look at all of those with the with whichever company it is we we go with to see if we can be smarter in terms of the use of whether it's portable units or whether it's hawkers with um backpacks you know i think there's it, it opens having a new partner opens up a lot of new opportunities for us to take a, a fresh look at how we how we serve our our supporters as i say before the game and at half time when when the um sales period is is pretty short to be honest 
Great stuff, Mark. That's it for all the listener questions. So I guess before we let you go, it's a big week uh, for Orient. We've obviously got Nigel's Q&A tomorrow, and then we've got a home game on Tuesday and a home game on Saturday. So I guess tell us against what your movements are and your feelings for, for the week that's coming up. Yeah, I would, I would encourage, uh, um, you know, Nigel. Uh, uh, he has to be the most... I've worked in football for too long that I care to remember. He has to be the most open and honest chairman I think I've ever worked with and for, to be honest with you. So I would uh, encourage fans to um, to tune into the Q&A tomorrow and to ask um, Nigel whatever questions they've got on their minds. I think I will be uh, riding shotgun somewhere beside him in case there's anything he can't answer, although Nigel's a, a bright, intelligent guy. I have to say that, obviously. Um <laughs> But, uh, yeah, uh, myself and Steve Tate, who is our new chief operating officer, join us in October from Ipswich Town and having previously been at Spurs. So we'll both be around to answer any questions that either Nigel can't or are more appropriate for either Steve or I. Um, and in terms of the next week, well, it's 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 plans to, it looks uh, like it's going to be one hell of a week, really. The Blackpool game now takes on real significance given where they are and where we are and, and you know, both of our results on, on Tuesday. Uh, we then have Bristol Rovers, which looks like uh, already being uh, a sellout uh, on Saturday. Um, and then we've got Port Vale, which is our, you know, it's £10 for adults and a pound for under 18s and we hope we can sell out as much of the home area as possible. If we can pick up you know, uh, nine points from our next three home games. Who 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 knows quite where this team's going to get us with the sort of spirit and camaraderie and ability that they've got under Richie's guidance. So, really looking forward to um, two two great home games this week, and obviously a really exciting end to the season. As I say, I've got, I, I would like the fans to to know that no one is no one is frightened of getting into the championship. We uh, we didn't anticipate it. We're ahead of where we thought we would be in terms of on the field. Um, but if we get ourselves into those playoffs, who, who knows what could happen? Uh, I've, I've seen it read that we're probably not ready for it. Well, you know, you, let's get ourselves into the playoffs first and see where that gets us. I know we're ready for it off the field. We're getting better all the time there. We're not perfect. I understand that. Um, and we will try and continue to improve, obviously. But um, but it, it's it's going to prove to be a really exciting next two or three months. Uh, it's not something I suspect any of us really thought about back in November. Um, so you know, it's uh, I really want to thank the fans. Their their support at home has been wonderful, and the noise that created away from home has been has been fantastic. And and Oxford was uh, yet another occasion where. Um, the, the fans really helped to get the team across, albeit the team were in the ascendancy for most of it. So really looking forward to this week and beyond and just want to thank the fans for their fantastic support so far. Just keep it up. So that was our conversation with Mark Devlin. And as always, thanks to Mark for coming on and giving up well, three quarters of an hour on yeah. the Sunday Sunday evening. Uh, for him, that would be work. So we really appreciate you, Mark. And thanks for your... Uh, honesty and transparency and openness as always we you know are very very lucky that we have a board and a group of owners and and people that are running the football club to be so open and honest and transparent with us so uh, thank you very much also to everybody that sent in their questions we hope that you um, are happy with the answers that you've got Uh, otherwise you can just email mark directly Um, so let's move on then uh, with the rest of this uh, podcast and we'll start with an update from the supporters club on saturday the 9th of march we're off as we mentioned with Mark. We're off up to Wigan. Coaches will leave the supporters club at 8 o'clock in the morning. It's a bit of an early one there because it's such a long journey. Adult fare for that is £30. Concessions are 36 and kids travel for £20. Then the following week we are away at Stevenage, 16th of March. That's a 3 o'clock kickoff. There is a one-off fare for this one. It's 25 quid for this trip and kids are going 13 quid. The coaches are leaving at the later time of 12 noon. That's a midday leave because it's only up the road. Uh, and obviously those prices do not include your match day ticket. You need to acquire those separately. There is a £3 surcharge for non-members and all children must travel with an adult. So to book for any of those trips or any of the future trips coming up, there aren't that many left now, um, go into the supporters club on a match day or you can call the travel line which is 07 507 539 
579 and Malcolm will gladly take your booking. Yeah, the last part of our support club update, as you probably all know, the Starman Award, which takes place at the end of the season, is happening again at the end of this season. This down for Sunday, April the 28th at the Prince Regent Hotel. Tickets for this one cost £75. It also includes a lovely free course dinner and also an opportunity to meet the first team squad and the management and the board. It's been a great night uh, since we've been going over yeah. the last couple of years. Always great fun. Uh, if you want to go, I think there's a few tickets left. This one hasn't quite sold out yet, but very close to doing so. You can email loscevents at all.com or you can go and speak to the committee uh, on a match day in the supporters club. As I say, this was the most sought after ticket last season. People just couldn't get in there. There's a few left now. And it might even be a playoff party, potentially, fingers crossed, who knows. But 75 quid, Sunday, April 28th, it's going to be a fantastic night. So get be there, be suited up, I'd love to see you there. Yeah, put your glad rags on and get to the Prince <laughs> Regent in Chigwell. So we've got two pieces of AOB this week. Unfortunately, they're not very positive, uh, and actually they're quite sad. sad news, um, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, we were saddened to learn about the passing of Kelvin Kiango who was the father of one of the Academy under-12s players. And we are really sorry to, to hear that. And we uh, send our condolences to the uh, Kiango family uh, and rest in peace, Kelvin. Yeah, second piece of sad news. We mentioned it with um, Mark, which came out on Saturday evening as the club tweeted that former Orient player Stan Bowles passed away. <coughs> uh, played for us, like we mentioned, in the 80 81 season and lots of nice tributes from O's fans and as well as football fans from all across the UK and wider so rest in peace Stan and we send our commiserations to Stan's family and friends indeed so let's move on then to the week that was and happy Monday the 19th of February was a very quiet day so nothing to report so let's move on yeah to Tahue literally Literally. Tahue Tuesday the 20th of February is happy Tahue day to everyone it's 13 years ago to the day that we played Arsenal in the FA Cup and that John Tahue goal, the 88th oh. minute equaliser, complete limbs, John Tahue capable of anything, puts it in the back of there, Slade loses his cap, pandemonium all over the stadium, 13 years ago now. Oh, hairs on the back of my neck still <laughs> stand on end when I think of that, 88th minute and we got that equaliser. Uh, supporters Club held a meet the manager evening with Paul, with Paul Terry stepping in at the last minute after Richie uh, couldn't make it, I think he went to watch Oxford uh, play at Northampton uh, and with our thanks to David Carroll Heavy D who sits in the South Stand for sending over the main talking points Richie um, couldn't attend yep so uh, he was at Oxford but he said uh, Paul said that Adam Thompson's loan has no recall or break clause and we've got a few names to explore for centre back in the free agent market yeah absolutely we'll be keeping a very close eye on that one Paul also went on to say there were a number of questions regarding contracts and transfers which basically rebuffed as I guess you'd expect him to do. Yeah, indeed. With regards to Theo, uh, Theo Archibald, Paul Terry said the club have already or will discuss it with Theo, but he doesn't expect them to turn their back on a player who got injured in battle as they have never done it in the past. Yeah, we mentioned that obviously on last week's podcast and have the same view as what Paul does. Paul said he hates the blue card, the sin bin proposal, and he's an anti-VAR, but he said it needs to be done properly and funded. We also need to realise... You can't solve every decision. I mean, I watched the League Cup final today. Okay. It was horrible. Like, it just, the VAR takes so much away from, and they're literally talking about like the closest of decisions that could go either way or almost unconclusive. I think, yeah, I, I'm saying you've ruined it, one. isn't it? They've got over officious on it's, it. Yeah, they? it's ridiculous. Yeah, it ridiculous. should be for the clear ones, just to make sure. Um, one of the questions was uh, asked of him Does he have a favourite crowd chant and his favourite? Couldn't be repeated uh, in that forum. He massively loves the drum and then said the only ones he didn't like are the ones about how bad we are. Yeah, yeah I think Richie has, has said that before when he first came to the club. In terms yeah, of the which I don't think we really... Songs. Yeah, Not anymore, but obviously there's a few that we used to sing or yeah, have sung and, how bad. and fans have come to our yeah. place and sung that. So there was a break for a little while. After a break, um, Paul's view on VAR in the lower leagues said if done right and there was the finance in place to do so, it could be good. Yeah, he said, to him and Rich, does he and Richie come as a package or would he stay 
post Richie, that was the question. He said it's down to the gaffer first and then the club if either want him. However, his preference would be to move with Richie as he wants to work under a successful manager. Yeah, I mean, we've had Paul on the podcast a few times. I think that was one of the first questions that came up and, and Paul kind of alluded to the same. doesn't see himself as a number one, sees himself yeah. as a number two. A few other points um, like we he covered. Uh, says John Terry has been and continues to recommend uh, Chelsea youngsters to him, which is um, not not a bad place to be. No, but he doesn't know about the plans for pre-season. But he would be disappointed if there was no warm weather training. And just to come back on the John Terry and the Chelsea connection, I read in an, on another group that I'm in that I think Chelsea want their youngsters going at a higher level than League One, which is why we perhaps well, are from, being flooded by well, most from Championship. If you look at Hutchinson's at Ipswich. Exactly. I, don't know, I can't name you any others but that's my main point of reference yeah. like most of them will go yeah. what was one at Huddersfield or we got Huddersfield who's doing alright yeah no surprise there yeah. in terms of summer transfer plans rebuffed that said ask Lingy so thanks again to Heavy D David Carroll for sending us uh, his notes on the evening if he did go I hope you had a, a most wonderful time indeed thank you very much indeed oh it's probably worth saying that there is going to be a meet the manager of Richie that is going to be rescheduled I think Sports Club did put it out on social media so again as soon as that date uh, is made available we will obviously be tweeting about it and mention it hopefully it's not arranged for a Tuesday evening where any other League One games are happening that Richie might want to get to <laughs> yeah where our opponents will be <laughs> um, in the evening the young oh this is still Tuesday the 20th of February the young O's were in action they were away at Arsenal's under 17s the hosts took the lead in the 12th minute and then doubled their lead from the penalty spot just four minutes later the O's tried to find a way back in and were awarded a penalty in the 33rd minute unfortunately Abdi's effort was saved uh, and we went in 2-0 down at the break in the second half Arsenal scored in the 75th minute and 78th minute killed the game as they as the scoreline ended 4-0 to Arsenal. So unlucky to the young O's. Good opportunity to showcase where they need to be in terms of ability and you know longevity in the game. Yeah. So yeah, good good test for them. Un, un, unfortunate. Yeah, unlucky there. Wednesday the 21st of February, the club confirmed that young O Makai Welch was being called up to Jamaica squad for the upcoming CONCACAF Under-20 Championship. And he made his debut yesterday uh, as they won 1-0 over Martinique. So well done to Mackay. Well done, Jamaica. I guess we'll see how they get on in the under-20. It's a good winning start. Hopefully they're going to win the thing. Absolutely. I don't know who's in it or who's not in it. So fingers I crossed. did see the, the graphic, but I don't recognise any names. There's a couple that aren't with clubs. There's a couple with some championship clubs. Yeah. So, yeah, none that we'd be aware of. In the afternoon, uh, this is still Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon, an Orient 11 made up mostly of academy and some first-team squad players and some trialists play in a behind-closed-doors friendly against the Southampton side, with the match ending 1-0 uh, and Joe Piggott scoring for the O's. Good to see Piggott found in that, yeah, I would say, absolutely. in that one. I'd be interested to see who the trialists were. Not that you ever find out until you actually sign them, but I imagine the defence centre-backs centre -backs in particular yeah, were made up of right. trialists. So, yep, yeah, we'll see if anything else comes out of that. And to end the day, the club announced that it's dedicated her game to match day. It will take place on Saturday, 23rd of March, against Exeter City so we look forward to more content there that from the club putting out as, as the fixture gets closer there shall be a lot of activity around that indeed Thursday the 22nd of February was a very quiet day with no news to report so let's move on yeah Friday 23rd of February not much to talk about the club announced that O's chairman Nigel Travis will be going live on the club's YouTube channel so we spoke about that with Mark as well that's tomorrow on Monday the 26th of February as this records starts at half past six He's going to answer your questions for up to an hour. So normally they go slightly over an hour. I think the questions have already been submitted, but obviously on YouTube there's a live um, chat box that you can do where I presume they'll be taking live questions as well. So if you're around, get watching that. It's at half past six tomorrow evening on the club's official YouTube channel with Mark Devlin and also Steve, who's the COO. So it should be, um, it should be a good session. I presume we'll talk about uh, investment for the most part, which is what this is followed on from, but I'm sure the playoffs... And championship football will come up. I dare say you're right. the training ground based on what Mark's probably yes. said tonight as well. Um, Saturday the 24th of February as we move through the week. Now the youth team were due to be in action against Stevenage but the game was postponed and it's been rescheduled for midday Wednesday the 28th of February. So good luck to the young O's then. Yeah, we'll cover that in next week's podcast. So the main event was the trip to Oxford United and before the game as always we ran a Twitter poll to find out how you thought the O's would get on in this one. We had 384 votes in Dan Hart. Not too bad at all. Quite a close one this one. Mm. So 28% of voters thought this would end in a draw and a split winner with 36% mm. thinking the O's would lose and an equal 30% 
of the voters, six, yeah. thinking the O's would win. That's yeah. as close as what's ever been. Never so known it that, that close yeah. before. Yeah, Thanks yeah, to everyone round. who voted in that one. I'm glad to say 30% of you were correct yeah. in the right favour. Indeedy. So at two o'clock, the team was announced with Sol Brin in goal, Ethan Galbraith at right back, Beckles, Cooper, centre backs, Tom James at left back. Uh, Elmiz and Darren Prattley were the two holding, with Ford, Monker, and O'Neill the front three with uh, behind Sotiriu. Substitutes for this with Sam Howes, Jaden Sweeney, Rob Hunt, Max Sanders. Dan Adujay, Keon Edwards, and Joe Piggott. Yeah, so side saw two changes to the lineup uh, last Saturday against Burton and Albion. As Tom James came in, he replaced Rob Hunt, who dropped to the bench, and Rob Sotiri came back into the starting eleven, replacing Carlin Edwards, who also took his seat on the bench. So at two o'clock, as you were sitting in the Kassam Stadium, because I, I saw was. your tweet at one fifty-five saying you was in the ground. What were your thoughts, Mister Lever, when you saw yeah. that? Yeah, well, first of all, I was <laughs> delighted to be back where the magic happened 18 years previously. Um, I second guess whether Tom James would start because I thought Rob Hunt hadn't done too badly mm. the previous week. So he'd done me out of a, a spot on, uh, on my fan hub uh, guess. Um, and I didn't predict that Ruel would start. I thought he'd keep it as is oh. because last week he scored two goals, but he started as a sub. So did me out there. But otherwise, pretty much as you'd expect, you don't change a, you know, a side for the sake of it um, maybe would have left Ruel on the bench as the impact sub because he's done so well in that the last few games but the bench is quite good there with options for Richie and obviously Joe Piggott um, sits back on the bench uh, as well from having some time out um, for whatever he was doing recovering from a knock or whatever it was spot on 11 out of 11 did you really? Home, I love, yeah I thought Tom James would come in and mm. I thought Ruel would start based on this is a bit more of a, a difficult game tactically in terms of it's the two games Edward started well I think he done alright didn't set the world light but didn't do too bad but obviously two it's home difficult. games against lesser opposition whereas this is away to Oxford who was six bigger stadium mm. I thought Satu would start so happy to get 11 out of 11 there so yeah no complaints for me once again a very attacking bench but making the best of what's available in terms of there's no centre backs on the bench but we haven't got any centre backs to put that just got yeah. full backs uh, essentially so we had a few tweets um, when that team was announced James O'Hagan said some big performances needed after Barnsley I think he probably means Burton but we'll, you know uh, probably the strongest squad that we could provide and he wanted to say so much for my Edwards scores too British yeah Paul Red Rum said slightly negative selection with Prattley ahead of Sanders even though we all love one more year Darren Prattley but just makes the midfield slightly static up the O's JME Ray 72 said lack of options in midfield from the bench pressure on the midfield three and Galbraith to avoid silly bookings. Len Chin Chin once said, Oxford away, and because of injury, we feel the weakened side. The hosts have six games unbeaten, although draws, winning only one in their last eight. So it's a bit of a big ask. O's, be clinical, play sharp and alert, watch the counters, of course, defend well. At best, we can hope for a draw. Danger from Murphy and Harris. Oh, how you were wrong there, Len. Len, always pleased to nice say this. Team talk. So the match kicked off in a bright but chilly Oxford with the O's looking to bounce back from last week's defeat to Burton Albion against an Oxford United team occupying the last playoff place, slightly out of form in a game that the O's needed to win to keep their faint playoff hopes mm-hmm. alive. So I guess as Len said, they were well unbeaten in six, but they hadn't won many loads. I think they'd only won one and drawn the five. So they may be unbeaten, but not on a fantastic yeah. run yeah. of winning a game. So we won our first corner in the second minute. The ball came back out to some James who misplaced his pass. When Oxford trying to counter-attack, Oddie O'Neill mm-hmm. fouled Murphy, took a yellow card for it, with Murphy also picking up, booking in the process, as he fouled O'Neill as well. So two early bickings there in the game. Yeah, absolutely. Probably was the kind of red flag to say that this is ah. going to be very, very much a... Uh, a card happy referee eight minutes on the clock now and we had our first shot on target that came from Ruel Sotiriu who'd found who was found well after a good driving run forward from George Monker following some decent orient possession it's fair to say we'd started this much much the better side his shot from a tight angle was palmed away by coming though yeah unfortunate certainly there for the keeper that did make me laugh I thought that was a great run there from um Monker really drove forward. That's what I want to see George That's right. do. Take the ball Dangerous, forward and, yeah. and create spaces for other players. Idris El Mazzuni took a booking in the 16th minute for a foul on Rodriguez, who was advancing at pace. I think that was a clear booking there. Free kick was taken. Solberg and forced into his first save by Brannigan. Decent save there from Sol. Yeah, absolutely right. A minute later, Oxford took the lead after a nice move. So Rodriguez played in behind Tom James on the right. He was in acres of space. He put a cross into the box, but Gooderham's clever back flick at the near post took a slight deflection off Ethan Galbraith as it went into the back of the net to make it 1-0 
to the hosts. I mean, that's completely against the run of play. Uh, they've had one one attack at goal. Tom James was a bit flat-footed, ball-watching. The ball's played in between him and, I think, Cooper um, and Rodriguez is away. Poor goal to give away. And obviously, you could then say, well, then there's another phase of play and Galbraith allows Goodrum to run in front of him and to be there to be able mm. to get that uh, flick on. Um, I can't see... I didn't see the deflection then and I can't see it in the replay, so it must have been the slightest of mm. deflections, but... Uh, good goal it is. Yeah. I think poor defensively from us but they took their chance well I thought Rodriguez was really good uh, when he played them at Brisbane Road I think he's a tasty little number 10 yeah. um, but yeah like I said against the run of plays 36 minutes in good pressing by Ollie O'Neill saw us win the ball back he played well to two in and he in turn found George Moncur his shot was weak and comfortably saved at the near post yeah another good move a minute later saw Brandon Cooper find Idris El Mazzouni with a first time pass this is on the highlights this is really brilliant he drove forward could have taken the shot he ended up passing it to George Monker, but his side-footed effort was comfortably saved by coming, uh, and Oxford ended up clearing the danger. I thought that was a poor ending. That I think that that move deserved a goal or should have ended in a goal. El Elmiz really should have had the shot. It didn't. It was. I I felt we were guilty of overplaying at times. Like we took too many touches. We didn't move the the ball quick enough. They took two or three touches when one or two would have been plenty. Um, and I, th I felt that players weren't shooting when they had the chance. They wanted to play it, literally yeah. to walk it in the goal when, when we didn't really need to do that. Um, and, and George, he's just gone straight down the middle, either side with a bit of height on it. You're talking one one all. Yeah, I thought it was a good run by Idris. I don't blame him for part. I think passing to George was the right move, but Monker doesn't. You see him swing his foot back. He doesn't get any power on it at all, or any curl yeah. on it at all. Mm. I it's don't like blame George for shooting. I would expect George Moncur to shoot in that situation, yeah. but the shot wasn't very good. Um, <laughs> ultimately, yeah. um, so um, chance gone. Forty second minute, coming was again in action as he pushed away Shaq Ford volley uh, at second attempt from outside the area. Decent effort there from Shaq. Very decent. Yeah, absolutely. Four minutes of additional time and up on the board, and in the first minute, Shaq Ford appeared to be brought down inside the box by Brannigan, but shock horror, no penalty. Well, I've not, this still wasn't on the highlight, so. All I can do is go by tweets and I think Matt Howard mentions it in his post-match interview saying we think it was a penalty. Yeah, it looked it. Again, without seeing it, I can't comment. But even, I watched a YouTube vlog from an Oxford fan that was doing the rounds. It was really good actually. He was really fair to Orion and he said like, I've seen those ones given. Yeah. So even the Oxford United fan We've got nothing off that record said like, he was surprised yeah. that that wasn't given. But there you go, sometimes you win him, sometimes you lose him. In the second minute of injury time, Paul Sotiri picked up a book in has he got his shirt pulled? He was shirt pulling, yeah. Um, but then his shirt was being pulled previously by that same player yeah. just a second ago. So the referee was, was being very biased towards um, uh, in favour of, of Oxford because if you're going to book Ruel, you needed to have booked the other man. Just not or the other guy was just clever yeah. enough that he, the ref didn't see it. Uh, shock. Uh, no further action to talk about. Referee brought the half to a close with the O's going in a goal down at the break. Yeah, so it's announced at 8,884 with 1,125 fans, including mm. yourself, making the journey. Well done, Mr. Levy. Yeah, lovely. Great away trip there. Another half with so much possession. I think we have had over 62% of the ball. We've got nothing to show for it, and despite having four shots on target. So, a bit disappointed there. We've got to be a little bit more industrious, a little bit more um, um, clinical in, 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 the, in our final delivery, in our final shots. Yeah, OK. No changes at half-time for the O's. Oxford got the second half underway. Brandon Cooper picked up a book in for a foul in the 49th minute. Yeah, we equalised, though, in the 51st minute. Nice team passing move. Eventually saw Idris El Mazzouni get the ball to Oli O'Neill inside the box. Took a touch before shooting into the far corner of the net to make it one all with his second goal for the O's. Very nice. Good goal. Sweet finish from yeah. Oli. Yeah, I mean, I, if you're being critical of them defensively poor from them all over the place and in the build up to Idris getting the ball they have numerous chances to get rid of it but we do well I think we fight for the ball really well I think Shaq does really well in the build up as well that we haven't mentioned uh, Idris could assist Oli O'Neill looks like an absolute gem an absolute still doesn't he um, at the moment doesn't he great goal and a great response to what Richie and Paul and Matt said at half time to equalise in the 51st minute heads up crowd behind you 
got 40 minutes to go in the game. Love absolutely it. right. Uh, the way we kept possession of the ball, despite there being loads of Oxford players around us, was absolutely delightful. That first touch, first time pass, mm. where we've moved the ball quicker, exactly what I was saying before, where we didn't move the ball quick enough. Yeah, it was yeah. so laboured in the build-up. This time, we're quicker, we're insightful, there's movement, uh, superb football, good finish, nothing less than really what we deserved. Yeah, absolutely. 56 minutes in, Idris El Mazzuni was taken out by Kieran Brown, about 20 yards out from goal, following some good possession. Tom James took the result on free kick. You could see him looking over it and you're thinking he's going to hit the target here. He did hit the target, but Cumming made a very good save to tip the ball over the bar. Good effort yeah, from Tom. That was a really good effort and that was heading to the top corner. 62 minutes now, superb play from Sotiriu. He got to the byline but he's, and his cutback was met by Oli O'Neill, but unfortunately his shot was blocked. OK, let's skip to the 76th minute and the O's took the lead as the ball came out on the left to Oli O'Neill. He slid the ball to George Monker. He had still loads to do, showed some real quality as he ran inside the box, created some space, then cut inside into the penalty area, beat two men, cold a shot, pass coming into the net to make it 2-1 to the Orient. Yeah, great goal that. Good build up to it as well. Uh, I think that was a lot of what we said. We had our composure and we were clinical. Great effort and, and obviously George enjoyed that one as well. Two and two for Monker. Yeah. Could get used to this. Yeah. Good team score from open play as well. Obviously, Penalty. Penalty previous week. Don't remember if he's scoring that many from open play in his O's career so far, but look, if he starts scoring them now, I won't be um, upset, but great to see him, see him do that. Yeah. And what a, what a return to form George Monger has had over the last couple couple of weeks. Great stuff. Right, two and up in the 78th minute. We made our first changes. Darren Prattley was replaced by Rob Hunt. Rob Hunt then went to right back. Ethan Galbraith moving into the midfield. Yeah, a minute later, big save from Sol Brin as a free kick was swung in from Brannigan on the right. Rodriguez's headed effort was going towards the bottom corner, but Sol was there to make the save. Good save there from young Solomon Brin in the <laughs> 81st minute. Shaq Ford was uh, this time his time to go into the referee's book. He picked up a yellow card. Yeah, 84 minutes now as we look to close this out. Richie Wellens was sent off for holding on to the ball and preventing Oxford from restarting the game as he was furious that Sol Brin's goal kick was uh, interfered with in some way by the Oxford player who was trying to prevent him from taking it. Uh, and also, apparently, he wanted to make a sub uh, prior to that as well. A few tweets about this. I know a lot of people pro Richie. I love Richie Wellens. He's got to stop being an idiot on the sidelines because this now means he's banned again. His third sending off of the season. I don't know what. I don't know how many games he's going to get banned for for this. At some point, if they're going to look at him and go, "How many red cards this guy had?" All right, we're well, obviously four. not learning. It's time for a more astute ban. So obviously, yeah. we don't know how long he's going to be banned for. That's not come out yet. But look, I'm all for passion on the touchline, right? And I get it. We all love Richie. Been a great job, but don't be stupid on touchline. If that was a player doing that for the third time, say that's Richie Williams is the most important Orient staff member on the sideline, right? So I'm going to make a maybe say Idris. I'm going to say an I'm going to say Idris exactly. Imagine this was Idris's third time of being sent off for doing something stupid, for talking back or a second yellow or stupid throwing challenge. a ball. We'd yeah. be doing our nuts, and every fan in the suite would be doing our nuts. Go, how stupid is Idris? Richie's kind of because we're doing so well I was almost getting I won't say free pass on this but a lot of fans are like oh it's Richie he's passionate <laughs> love it don't think it's the right thing for Richie to be doing it could cost us I mean if he's not on the sidelines for a game against Blackpool again that's another season mm-hmm. defining game that he might not be there for and yeah he, he, I know he he'll have time to appeal and all that so there's a process there is a process but yeah, and I know he's still in the stadium communicating with Matt because they've said that's what, the, what they do as long as he's loud in the stadium but that's still to the detriment of the team, the so I was yeah. really, I was really disappointed for that, and I know people were laughing. Oh, you know, what's new? Richie sent off again, almost like Theo Archibald getting yellow cards or whatever. But really silly for me. And I know he's annoyed, but there's a way to be annoyed and to get what you want and to get sent off again. For me, the only rule dampener of yesterday because yeah. we're missing our manager again. Indeed. Any views yeah, on that? I agree. No, no, I, I completely agree. I think I love the passion. I love the flair. Yeah, I love, the, I love him that he's fighting for for his players. <coughs> excuse me, and for fairness and equality, which is he shouldn't have to do that because the referee has made him do that. But like you said, you know, you control the controllables and, and you control your emotions and your actions, and you do it in a way that doesn't get you sent off. I completely agree with you. Um, and he'll probably admit that as well as a heat of the moment thing. Could see the minute he's grabbed the ball and he's turned his back to walk towards the fourth official, 
that hit some, some, that's not going to end well. You could see that. With the, I think we had him on after Bolton and he said like he would do anything to give us an advantage. And he'd do it again. Because that was to stop Bolton from potentially taking a quick throw, throw in, in to get him up the pitch where he, where he might too not, far ahead. Might get behind Beckles and they might have a goal scoring chance from it. Yeah. So I, I kind of got that one. I was like, okay, you've done something. But that ball was out of play. What, that ball was pretty much out of play and he just grabbed it and held on to it. Yeah, the ball's gone out and he's, he's then caught just, it and held it. Just pointless. Yeah, pointless. Because he was annoyed he couldn't make his sub and he's annoyed that he didn't, couldn't. Yeah. Couldn't and Sol's uh, goal kick was unfairly impeded. Who cares? Yeah, not not great. So yeah, we'll see what comes out of that one. Hopefully it's like a short ban. Yeah. I'm not sure it will be. Yeah. Anyway, sub was made sh- literally straight after that passage of play. Shaq Ford came off and was replaced by Carl. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, literally like 10 seconds later, Edwards comes on. Big challenge from Tom James in the 87th minute that took the ball away from Bowden as he approached the area. But two minutes later, Bowden was at it again as he sliced an effort he wide. Did. Seven minutes of time and up on the board in the first minute. Ethan Galbraith was subbed off and on came Max Sanders. Yeah, 90 plus five. Now Brandon Cooper put his body on the line in the area as the O's won a free kick to release some pressure. Yeah, Max Sanders picked up a booking in the 98th minute. And as the game was heading towards our goalkeeper, the Oxford keeper coming was up the pitch, but didn't matter. Referee blew at the full-time whistle with the mighty O's coming from behind against Oxford to seal all three points to leave the away fans delighted and singing their watching late in Orient songs to be applauded by the fans. Lovely moments. So Richie was sent off, like we mentioned. Which means he can't do post-match. It means he doesn't do post-match. Matt Harold has been up for well more than 24 hours. has been shared by the club. So we're not going to mention Matt's, but you, by all means, go and watch it on YouTube for more content from the club there. Exactly. That means the O's stay in ninth place in League One. Now we've now played 34 games. We've won 14 of them. We've drawn nine and lost 11. We now have a um, zero goal difference. And we have now accumulated 51 Points. All right, Ben Lejanda, you Let's were there, you were singing along, you had a great day out. Yeah, sounds about it. it. Yeah, fantastic, <laughs> fantastic. Big win, massive statement from us. I mean, how we lose against Burton but then go away to Ox- Oxford, excuse me, and beat Oxford is just chalk and cheese, really. I thought, you know, if you look at Oxford, it looked like that they were a team that were much lower in the table. They really didn't have much to come at us with, and it's really surprising considering they've signed, you know, some good players. They've got good quality players, a good good quality team. So, yeah, I I, I kind of see them not even making the playoffs no. if they carry on uh, like that. We were totally dominant. It was they we were at them when we are on our game, when we are pressing them with the high energy that we did. They didn't like it, and teams can't live with us when we press like that. And it's such a pleasure to watch. They only had one chance, really, in the first half. Mm. They scored that. They huffed and puffed in the second. Actually, they only really, in my view, started huffing and puffing with great effort once they'd gone 2-1 two one, two one down. Uh, they suddenly thought, oh, hold on a minute, we've got to get back in the game. So I, th- I, th- I really feel that they're lacking uh, confidence. And speaking to some Oxford fans afterwards, yeah, that they also feel that uh, something's not right there. Uh, within their own squad so plenty of good performances across the 11 there and, and the subs as well I thought uh, for me George Monker stand out mm. Idris stand out Ethan Galbraith stand out and, and O'Neill in particular was standouts for me I thought the referee was awful handing out cards like a madman really gave them fouls but then when it was against us didn't give it wave play on but then something innocuous completely innocuous would happen and then would give them the foul for that. and So it, it was very frustrating and, and that's why refs get a bad rap because of the, um, because of the inconsistencies um, in their decision making. But yeah, look, overall, great day out. Uh, my son and his friend and, and, and the, um, Daniel that we went with as well absolutely had a great time. Um, Oxford were really good. The stewards were decent, friendly, welcoming uh, and it's great to be back um, watching us come from behind and win a game. <laughs> <at Oxford. laughs> Love for it. you? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't there. I was in the cinema. So I went into the cinema. We won down at half time, and I, I was like, I'm not going to look at my phone until we get out of here. So I was pleasantly surprised when I saw we won 2 1. But that win just about keeps you hoping, doesn't it? Like, you look at you, like, oh, it's back on now. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> so we're going like to it on Tuesday, uh, all hopeful. But I think, you know, I think that's a tell in my eyes of two teams on two different trajectories. I thought Oxford was superb when we played them uh, at our place. They just lost their manager. And I think you can really tell their management appointment, I can't remember the guy's name, their manager, it's not working out from and the guy who's gone to Bristol City, Liam Manning, they're really missing him. 
because when they came to us, their town was all here, there, and everywhere. Yeah, they looked potent up front defensively. They looked great. And then from yesterday, from what I've seen and what I've heard, it looks like it was the other way round. So you can really see the progress we've made since October. Agree. And the detriment that they've made, which is, I guess, a massive testament to Richie Wellens and, and his coaching staff. With a barely put together squad in terms of there's several first teamers out, first choices out, you know, injuries, yeah. suspension, that kind of thing. Absolutely. But, you know, I think I mentioned I'm not impressed with Wellens from his actions yesterday. I love the guy, but, you know, I think when you add up his suspensions over the season, I think he'll, he'll miss up to 15 to 20% of our games. You think four, four games is 10%. He's easily missed four games already. If he gets number three, four game bounce, almost twenty percent of games he's missed from the sidelines. And again, if you're going to miss out on the playoffs, which we probably will do by five or six points, you know it comes down to very, very small margins. And not having your manager on the sidelines for some of that time could cost us quite substantially. Fort Moncur, I've got to say, well played. Played for ninety nine minutes. Been a lot of jokes about George over the last six months a year I think it's fair to say I think he's really coming back to show those people what he's about like I said I think Idris has been amazing over the last two or three months I think it's been brilliant sounds like Galbraith putting up a big performance Brim makes a big save I think there's big performances all over the pitch really Oli O'Neill seems like an absolute steal yeah. based on the short amount of time we've seen him play so yeah really happy with that one still in it let's hope it kills you mate <laughs> bring it on see you yeah. Tuesday <laughs> we'll be there we will be there so those are our views on the Oxford game so there we got a huge amount of feedback after this so thanks to everyone for sending your views into our social media accounts and again we're going to read as many as we can uh, and just because we read some of them it doesn't mean that we agree with them Orient Meat Pie kicks us off this week and said you beauties a fantastic second half and everyone dug in Ollie O'Neill was amazing but everyone put in a shift we love a win at Oxford we certainly do. Joe Jessner, 16, says such a good performance. Second half of the season, Moncur is a menace. Yeah. Uh, Dan Alton, 2590, said fantastic response after half time. Win was fully deserved. Looking at the game in its entirety, lack of discipline was probably at its worst today. And the way that Rich is going, he might get himself a season ticket. Going to spend more time in the stands than on the touchline. I don't think our discipline was the issue. I think the referee was the issue. On this. I think, so I think we've said it. I mean, I've not seen all the bookings, so I can only go by what people have said. But if you give the ref decisions to make, especially at an away ground, but I don't he's think there were decisions them. to be made in, su- in some of them. Not all of them, granted. Idris's, some the only ones I've seen, Idris's, which was definitely a yellow card. Cooper yeah. was booked for a foul, I believe. I'm not seeing that foul. I think the shirt pull again. I'm not seeing. I'm not seeing it. There was so. shirt pulling going both ways, but only we got books. That's what I'm saying. That it wasn't equal. Mm. Like they got a foul, we didn't get the same when a foul when a similar foul was done on us. That's that. That's it's just the inconsistency of the referee. So I don't think we were overly um, poorly behaved. I just think the referee was much quicker to book us than he was to even think about getting a card out for them. Either way, and I lot, don't know why that yellow happened. cards. Oh, too many. Far Absolutely too many. too many. But then they should be aware that if the referee is like that, then they need to be on extra good Absolutely, yeah. 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 The Untold Games said, Ethan Galbraith once again taking the Idris El Mazzouni <laughs> man of the <laughs> match award for me. O'Neill, damn close to it as well. Yeah, Racka Blue a fantastic win. Thought we were in a much better side in the second half. Thought Moncur, Galbraith and El Miss class ref abysmal from minute one. Didn't mm. feel like we were under much pressure from the opposition today. Onwards we go on the League One train. Patrick G three two one said it's a massive result. George Moncur has gone from useless fatty to Ansu fatty <laughs> in the space of three weeks. I've been working on that joke all week. Well done, Patrick. Shame Brilliant. the other teams immediately above us all won today, but this O side keeps surprising me. Bring on Blackpool. Yes, Ron Sampson fifteen said deserved win. We've got a gem in Ollie O'Neill. Shame about Richie. Very harsh decision by the ref. Another three points, and we go again Tuesday. Matty LOSC Evans said playoffs are back on. Question mark six off twelve. Sorry, six off with twelve games to go means it's not mathematically out of reach. George Moncur deserves all the credit for today. This is the monks we've been we've craved for since he joined us. Salty Oxford tears taste so unbelievably good. <laughs> He's, that's what I've been saying the last few games that George has you know in the last few weeks where he stepped up and has really yeah. been seeing what we've been waiting to see from him. Yeah, fingers crossed it long continues. Absolutely. Orient underscore Ed said, couldn't be more thrilled that my prediction of a 5-0 defeat was so wrong. We looked so much better when we played the pressing game. The defence and only were brilliant. But once again, George Moncur was man of the match and he played 90 minutes. Only negative was the amount of cards on to Tuesday. Yeah, Essex Beer said, brilliant result. With all the injuries we've got, I had a feeling that we'd win today. I hope, uh, hope I get a few more of them before... 
uh, before the end of the season. So important now for the team to stay focused one game at a time. Every squad member and staff member is going to be needed. Yeah, good point. M8 Axel said an amazing win and hard fought performance all round. Shame about the crooked ref. We've seen some bad ones, but that took the biscuit. Oxford didn't threaten us at all. And if only we had Graham, Theo, Adji and Happy for the final stretch. What? Yeah. Four, five Good big point. players sitting out at the moment. LOFC Teresa said deserve something from the first half, but then came out and showed how good we are. Goals from Ollie and Monks, saves from Bryn. Yeah, it's a good point. We haven't really mentioned that many of them. There was a couple that I missed, but he made a couple of Bryn. really important saves, yeah. Sol Bryn, yeah. Uh, must get on top of the yellow cards. I love Richie, but these cards are not good. Another big game coming. Arcoral 1972 said that win was so orient. I don't know what to say about Moncur. He's gone from looking like a busted flush to Iniesta in the space of a month. That's the Moncur we've been waiting for. Fantastic result after last week. I'm nil looking like a proper signing as well. Yeah, Phil VZ1 says, super thrilled with this bounce back win after last week's disappointment. The resurrection of Monks' is gathering steam makes Tuesday night a massive match. Come on, Orion. Dear Stu, says you can say all you want about Richie getting sent off again, but to be in the position we are with the amount of injuries to key players we have He's doing some job and he's proper backing in the summer mm. and we could be a serious threat next season. We have got to keep Helmets. Yeah, Casey Adams, LOSC said, I said a few weeks back, we still have to play Oxford, Peterborough, Blackpool and Stevenage. If we get positive results against them and we stand a chance, still don't think we'll do it, mine, but it's the hope that kills you. <laughs> to your point, earlier, what, what a it win. It is very good win. The tipping team's a great win, great performance, great atmosphere. I mean, it was some signing. I just wish... We could get Shaq too. First season game from Cooper for ages as well. Actually, used the ball really nicely a few times. Hopefully, not a fluke. I don't blame Reynolds for the wet red either. The ref was hopeless. Yeah, Linda Brogan said, whatever George Moncur is putting on his shredded week, it's working wonders. Class all round today yeah. and a very well-deserved win. Penultimate tweet on this one goes to Kevin Cowlin, who said, totally dominant performance. Nothing less than three points would have been justified. Great goal from George. Back to his best. And we had to beat 12 men. The ref was awful. Clear he's never played the game in his life and doesn't understand it. And P.S. It's happening, isn't it? The playoffs. Yeah. Final word goes to Mike Orient. Said, with major players out injured, our players' self-belief is showing. Yes, we're still making mistakes, but we are in League One now, so teams are going to punish you. What a season we're having. We are punching well above our weight and long may it continue. Amen there, Mike. Yes. So let us know if you agree or disagree with any of the tweets that have been read out on this one. You can do that by tweeting us. We can be found at Orient Outlook. If you want to give us an email, you can do that at Orient Outlook at Outlook.com. We are on Instagram, Orient underscore Outlook underscore podcast, or you can find us on Facebook as well at Orient Outlook Podcast. You can indeed. So let's move on then to the Prediction League. Well done to those of you who correctly predicted 2-1, of which there are numerous amounts of you. Well done, everyone. Martin uh, Riches 2 and Kevin Cowlin correctly predict, uh, predicted 2-1 and a scorer. So you guys get four points. But at extra special props to TX Trev, who hit the jackpot with a 2-1 <laughs> scoreline. <laughs> And both scorers, well done. Uh, and that means the Prediction League is as follows. Yeah, so at the top, David Brew, 47976911, leads on 25 points. Just one point behind him on 24 points is Eastside Orient. Two points behind him is at Rio underscore Orient. And behind him on 20 points is Dan William H. and Paul R. Gregory. Thanks to everyone for their predictions. And a full Prediction League table can be found on our Facebook page or on Outlook Podcast. It most certainly can. So let's move on then as we wrapped up Oxford now to Sunday the 25th of February. And well done to Ollie O'Neill who made it into the League Papers League One team of the day following his performance against Oxford. I'm slightly surprised that George Moncur didn't make that either as well as or instead of. Well, Not that Ollie didn't deserve it, but mm. I don't know about everyone else, but I thought George really did deserve we'll that. see on the official um, sky one. one that I imagine comes out tomorrow so alright uh, with ladies updated in so after a number of attempts to get the game played those ladies finally met Regents Park Rangers for a greater London Women's Premier League match our, our pitch at Buckers Hill is at worst for wear after so much rain so this match was moved to an artificial surface in Walthamstone in view of how the properly coached Premier League teams play a flat surface suited both sides who went at it with some gusto from the start both were beaten last time out and if the respective coaches were looking for a positive reaction they both got it they did Hannah Jenks uh, Nima Carty and Liliane Almeida were dominant in the midfield and were spraying passes around like at a training match the forwards Maddie Wright Leanne Bates and Erin Bright all provided the space and movement needed for the O's ladies to storm the Rangers goal 
However, near misses, the woodwork twice, and last ditch tackle combined to keep the women in red at bay. Yeah, just before half time, Grace Collins Edwards finally made the killer pass, and top scorer Leanne Bates took advantage of the opportunity. And just after half time, Leanne was involved again, this time provider, and she teed up Lillian Almeida, who hit a sweet shot to give us a 2 0 breathing space, which we needed. As within a couple of minutes, Rangers at number 14 arrived late in the box. Not for the first time, only this time she hit the ball cleanly and gave keeper Lola Durayei no chance. The rest of the game followed a pattern of Orient pressing and Rangers breaking, but in the 79th minute, Rangers failed to clear the loose ball in their area, which was pounced on by Madeline Wright, whose shot found him on the corner, and at 3-1, effectively put an end to the game. The three points mean that we move past Hammersmith, who could only draw today, and remain within reach of the top clubs. Rangers seem destined to suffer relegation. Highlights video plus a roundup of the Premier League will be published on the lofcwomen.com website uh, on Monday evening. What a great, great roundup. Okay. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Thanks to LFC Women for that. All right, so one hour, 29 minutes, and 54 seconds. Time to wrap up this bad boy. So, fantasy football has been going on, although not all Premier League teams played. There was a round of matches, and happy to say. That uh, top of the Orient Outlook podcast, Fantasy Football League Group. Uh, we'll come back to this because it's not loading. We'll keep, okay. going. We'll keep going. I can tell you I'm in 227th place, though, <laughs> but uh, the screen is blank. <laughs> right. Okay. No worries. Let's move on then to the positives and the negatives this week. And obviously, starting with the positives, a win, obviously, an away win, a very good away win um, as well. Uh, and obviously, the three points that we've now taken off there. Our goal difference is now at zero. Yes. It had slightly dipped uh, following our defeat last week, and the away end atmosphere was absolutely electric. So well done to the lads with the drum and the uh, those that start the chance. Brilliant. Brilliant stuff, yeah. Negatives for me, then I'll take the first up discipline issue. So although most of the yellows weren't justified, they were still giving us yellows. So that yellow tally is adding up and also the red card to Richie, which I guess we'll wait and see what his punishment will be on that one. And second of all, injuries, I think they were all listed in one tweet. So many Injuries, players missing, just think of what, I guess, the season of what could have been. Although the season's not over yet, so you don't actually know what might happen. Sometimes mm-hmm. in adversity, these things can happen. So, yeah. three positives, two negatives. To go back to fantasy football, it's very, very tight at the top. Jamie Wellham is top of the league on 1,665 points. Only six points behind him is Josh Abrahams, who's challenging. And only 11 points behind Josh in third place is Elliot Pearce. So, it's very, 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 very tight up at the top of the table I've had a bit of a shocking week down to 227th but it's all up and down mm-hmm. so it happens next week thanks so for playing with us yeah absolutely so let's move on then to Hero of the Week and we were unanimous I think yep. with this one so congratulations this week goes to George Monker my lord George, George Monker well so, done yeah I think you know performances have been brilliant Super really blind. good super blind. got his reward yesterday by yep. scoring a lovely goal dangerous all day like I mentioned, he played for 99 minutes. I think honourable shouts out, though. Could have been a number of players. Galbraith had a good game. So did Idris. Oli O'Neill gets an assist and a goal. Easily could have got into that. But this week, it just felt right to give it to our Lord. The resurrection of George Moncur. I love that. Wow. From, from Fatty to Ansu Fatty. That's a great one. That's great, that's great Great tweets this week about George. I'm sure, he, I'm sure if he is listening, he'll be laughing at some of those. Next week's fixtures then as we move on. It's another big week for the A's. We've got two home fixtures this week though. We're going to be welcoming Blackpool to Brisbane Row for a rearranged uh, fixture on Tuesday the 27th of February. They're currently 8th in League One. That's one place above us. They beat Bolton 4-1 at home. Former Orient defender Marvin Ekpateta oh, Marv. getting the fourth goal. They've won two, drawn one, lost two of their last five games. And then on Saturday, the 2nd of March, I can't believe we've got March next week, we welcome Bristol Rovers. They're currently 12th in League One. They beat Carlisle 2-1 at home on Saturday. They've won two and lost three of their last five games. So, yeah, could be quite open. Decent games, these. Let me tell you something. Big Marv still loves your Outlook podcast. Still follows the pod. He only follows 716 accounts. One is your own Outlook podcast. Still go. a lot of love. I think he'll get. Out of the, I think this is his first time back since he left the club. I believe because we haven't played Blackpool at any level at home in the time he's been away. So I'm sure yeah. he will get an amazing reception as he deserves. An absolutely pivotal player um, in our promotion from the conference season. So yeah, massive week. Like you said, beat Blackpool, and I think it seriously could be on. I think we'll all start to get. 
A bit more excited with 11 games left. All right, there. sponsorship reminder then. Don't forget to get in touch with John and their fantastic team of experienced florists at Carol Langley. Give them a call on 0208 529 4130. You can get in contact via social media, Carol Langley E4 or Essex Bridge on Twitter. They are on Instagram at Carol Langley Florists. They can be found on Facebook at Carol Langley Florists. Indeed they can. So that is it. Thank you very much indeed for joining us for episode 348. And after last week's disappointing defeat against Burton Albion, the O's needed a big performance and a statement to be made away at Oxford United to keep our season alive. And boy, did we get one as two second half goals saw the O's come out on top to take the points back to E10 and leave us all dreaming of still sneaking into the playoff places. Another massive week awaits us with two home fixtures. First, as we've just mentioned, we've got playoff hopefuls Blackpool and then Bristol Rovers. And if the O's can win both of these games, then who knows where we could end up. And you can hear about these uh, these matches next week and hopefully we'll be talking about another two Orient wins. And Mark Devlin was right. If we beat Blackpool, we do go above them. Wow, all right. Big, big games. If you're listening on iTunes, please subscribe. Give the podcast a five-star rating. If you're listening on Spotify, don't forget to follow the show and also rate the show. You can also leave a comment on each episode. So thanks to you who are doing that. We are getting a few comments on each episode. So thanks to everyone who's doing that. Please do so if you get a chance. Don't forget to add us to your favourites on any of your chosen podcast providers. And that way you get all of the episodes as soon as they are available. We are also on all smart speakers. We are also on FanHub. We are also on YouTube. Any platform you want to find us on, you'll be able to do so. So listening to the podcast has never been easier. If you've got an older relative, a loved one, an orange chum, a glory hunter who wants some of it, <laughs> bring them along, pass them the podcast, grab their phone, download it for them. And like we say every week, pass the pods. And we're going to be back, as we say, next week with episode 349 with all the information, news and views that you could ever need. And we look forward to hearing from you in the meantime. And as always, keep calm, stay safe, do have a great week. And listen to the Orient Outlook podcast. Up the O's.